stupid. All right. All right. Hello, everybody. This is Ryan over at High Carbon Generator. Today, I have uh, Peter Rogers, MD, with me. Uh, if you didn't watch the last interview, I'll put a little card up somewhere in the uh, wherever it shows up, top right, top left. Go check that out and then watch this one. Uh, any kind of links, I will put it down in the description section. I'll also try to pin it down to the comment section as well, if I remember. And welcome to the channel. Yeah, well, thanks. Yeah. All right. So I have a list of questions. I think one of the most uh, common questions, I don't know why they're asking me uh, to ask you this, but is what do you think, why do you think this Dr. Brooke Goldner is having so much success with her uh, diet? <laughs> See, it's how you ask the question, you know? Yeah. Because because you then you start going down a path. It's one thing to ask me about a food, but then you start asking me about a treatment regimen, you start going down a different path there. I mean, yeah. and you have to ask yourself, What's the primary problem with autoimmune disease? It's thought that it most often is some form of leaky gut. Yeah. So what is leaky gut? You got cells in your intestinal tract. They're all right next to each other. And in between them, there's a junction. Where my fingers are, those are the junctions. Okay, and these junctions got to be tight. Otherwise, food can get in between them. Normally, you should not absorb anything more than a dipeptide or tripeptide at the most, let's say, three consecutive amino acids linked in a sequence. If bigger chunks of protein get through, the body forms an immune response to them. And if that amino acid sequence is the same from an animal as from a human or similar enough, it can cross react with the person's own body. So that's molecular mimicry with autoantibody cross reactivity. And that's thought to be the most common mechanism of autoimmune disease. And I think it probably is because people seem to get better once they prevent leaky gut. So <clears throat> that is sort of like what Dr. McDougall recommends. He's got a whole bunch of testimonials at his site, this idea of Prevent leaky gut. Okay. So um, my next point would be look up all the different causes of leaky gut and avoid all of them. And a lot of them are obvious. Here's the way I see it works is that you got two types of gut flora. You got good gut flora from eating plant foods. They feed on the fiber. And then you got bad gut bacteria. And that comes from eating meat because there's no fiber and processed food because there's very little fiber. So you starve to death the good gut bacteria. And once you do that, the bad gut bacteria... They don't care about you. you know, well, first of all, let me explain. Why would the good gut bacteria care about you? It's because of a symbiosis, meaning a mutually beneficial cooperation that's been going on since humans been on the planet. For you, your good gut bacteria, for them, it's like a good apartment. They want to live there. They want to keep you alive. It's in their best interest to keep you alive. And so they do a whole bunch of things that, you know, processing nutrients like vitamin K and helping you to maintain your tight junctions. They convert the fiber into short chain fatty acids most important short-term fatty acid is butyrate. Butyrate is used by intestinal lining to maintain those tight junctions. Okay. Yeah. So when you don't eat the fiber, you can't make the butyrate and the lining cells of the gut called the enteric tract, um, they tend to have weak uh, junctions between the cells, leaky junctions. And that's how food starts to get in between those spaces. So what I'm saying is you want to fix the primary problem, eat more fiber and avoid all the bad stuff killing your good gut bacteria. Try to avoid fluoridated water. Try to avoid excessive antibiotics. Chlorinated water also does it too. You can take out the chlorine with a uh, carbon filter. To remove the fluoride, you're going to need like a reverse osmosis filter or distillation. And that's a whole other topic, but that's what you want. Preferably, you know, live in a place with well water, test it first, there's no fluoride in it. Um, and then there's other things that'll do it. Cooking oils will cause leaky gut. Dairy has a tendency to cause leaky gut. So you want to avoid using NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen, aspirin. So you want to avoid all those things. So what I'm saying is, if you do that, you fix the primary problem. So that's school of thought number one. Mm -hmm. I also think glyphosate and fluoride themselves distort uh, proteins and can cause autoimmune disease in and of themselves. Okay, but that's a relatively minor mechanism. Then the next thing is, well, what's the other approach? What does conventional medicine always do? Match the ill to the pill and send the bill. Okay, so you yeah. go to an uh, um, autoimmune doctor, rheumatologist, let's say. What are they going to do? If they confirm you got the diagnosis, they'll test for an autoantibody in your blood. Then they're going to put the patient on a immunosuppressant drug. Okay. So what's, what am I getting at? Well, perhaps, you know, they talk about omega-6 is increase inflammation. Omega-3 suppress inflammation. Are you potentially using the omega-3s like a drug? You know, basically you're immunosuppressing. If you're eating that lots of extra omega-3s, 
You know, flax is a precursor big time to a lot of omega-3s. Are you potentially suppressing the immune system in that way? And maybe you'll get a beneficial effect. You know, to my mind, though, you're, you know, flax has got a ton of fat in it, got a ton of estrogen in it, estrogenic chemicals, you know. Uh, so I don't want that. You know, I'm a macho man, okay? I don't want to be eating anything estrogenic. Soy's got a ton of estrogen, and flax is way above soy. And it's fat, too. Anything you eat, more high percentage of calories from fat, the more likely you are to gain weight. So why not just fix the gut first if you can uh, and um, see how that works? You're speaking of, of fat. Um, when I had I had Dr. McDougall on here a couple of days ago, and I asked him about a question that Keith Colin Campbell was asked. So let me look that up. I wanted to ask you as well, because it kind of pertains to everybody. So uh, Dr. T. Colin Campbell was asked um, about the statement, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. And he basically came back and said that's completely erroneous, that you should just eat whole foods, whether it's nuts, uh, seeds, avocados, uh, a potato, uh, you know, a broccoli, whatever it is, and you'll lose weight. So what what, what do you have? Uh, what, what's your uh, statement back to the uh, statement like that? Well, here's how I see it. When somebody can say eat an avocado, but in reality, like in nature, avocado is only in season for about two weeks out of the year. So yeah. you can't be buying it in the store every week. Um, I can tell you, McDougal's smart. I think he's the best nutrition doctor in the world. I've double checked him numerous times. He always ends up being right. Um, so don't get me wrong. Like any doctor, there's some things they won't talk about. Yeah. You know, you know, like they're not going to talk about water and F minus in the water. Okay. And there's other things people don't want to talk about. Nobody wants to talk. And I'm not going to get into all those things, but I'm just going to say the higher the percentage of calories of fat you eat, the fatter people tend to get. Mm. And you got to also our ancestors too. They're walking around all day outside. They're afraid they're going to starve to death. We're programmed to like fat foods, I think, because we're always worried biologically, ancestrally, of starving to death. But in the modern world, I think you got to be careful. Um, look at rice, for example. Rice, sweet potatoes, and regular potatoes are 1% fat. Yeah. The populations that eat that way, they're all skinny. Like the, you know, the Asians, the Chinese, Japanese, back when they ate rice, 80 or more percent of their diet, yeah. primarily yeah. white rice, they're all skinny, a billion out of a billion. In a Bruce Lee movie, like we, I think we talked about this, you know, yeah, yeah. the only guy was a guy who was on steroids is the only guy who's a big guy. Looks So I, I would say you want to minimize that dietary fat because you'll be prone to gaining weight. Uh, mm. I know for myself, that's been the case. And, uh, you know, from what I've seen epidemiologically, that's what happens. So I would, I would, I don't buy into this fat. What I, what do I think is the big picture of what's going on? I think there's a move to push the population off animal foods. Okay. And get mm. them to eat plant foods. But you know, big corporations never care about regular people. You're just a bunch of proles, a bunch of useless eaters in their minds. They don't care about you. And as a matter of fact, it's much more profitable to keep you fat and sick. Yep. So I think the push is to get the people to eat plant-based. That way, a lot more land is freed up for other things. But to keep all the proles, the proletariat, the plebeians, you know, keep them all eating high-fat foods so they'll be fat and sick. Okay. And um, so that's the way I see it. I don't. I think these fat foods, I, I have no interest in this stuff. The soy is high-fat. This flax is high fat. These avocados are high fat. All these seeds are high fat. Almonds and nuts. I recommend staying away from all that stuff. Fat is not good for blood flow. Fat causes obesity. Fat causes insulin resistance. And it potentially does other things too, like uh, making the blood prothrombotic. You know, omega-3 is less so, but I don't think there's any good fat. And, and you know, Nathan Pritikin said the same thing a long time ago. And then people say, well, what do you need your good fats? I think that's all BS. Mm. You can't, you can't, you can't. It's impossible to be too low in fat. Nathan Pritikin, you know, showed all these studies um, in his books, his paperback books. And I looked this stuff up as well. They were feeding populations 0.75% uh, of fat. And people did really well on that. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So it's impossible to be too low in fat. I would forget about it. And plant foods have a lot of omega-3s. It's not like, oh, you need these magical uh, omega-3 fats. Plus also, you talk about the brain, you know, oh, well, the brain needs them. Oh, the baby needs them when it's first born. But you can still remember stuff from your childhood. The reason you can remember your childhood is because those neurons don't turn over. So it's not like there's this tremendous turnover. And the amount of, of conversion of the, of the precursor fats like ALA into your subsequent omega-3s, it's adequate, okay? Uh, I would not be taking so many of them because I think you risk overdosing them. In addition, you know, we know how omega-6 PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids, they undergo lipid peroxidation. The more double bonds, the more lipid peroxidation you have. That's why if you buy omega-3s in a store like DHA or EPA, you got to keep them in a radio-opaque bottle because even light can make them lipid peroxidized. You got to stick them in the fridge right away. So you're going to yeah. be eating them into your 98.6 degree body and they're not going to undergo lipid peroxidation. 
Yeah, right. You know, I think it's BS. Okay. I think you're predisposed to oxidative stress. All right. And, and you were talking about Nathan Pritikin. So I wanted to ask you this actually in the last interview. I don't think I did. What do you think about this uh, term that came around probably around 77, uh, the balanced diet? What do you what do you think of the whole balanced diet thing? I know Pritikin was completely against the, even the term. I think it's sort of like <clears throat> ooh, hypnotize people, make them stupid. There's a lot of things that make people stupid. Good fats. You need your good fats. Oh, yeah, right. People love to hear that. So whatever they like is good fats, you know? Yeah. Like a, a typical conversation, I have a conversation with one patient, you know, and I feel sorry for the patient. You know, the guy's got possible cancer. He's had open heart surgery, you know, and uh, I'm like, you know, sir, you know, and also I see these diabetics. They have just had one foot amputated. The other foot's not looking so good. And I'm like, you might want to improve your diet. And he goes, oh, no, no, no. I eat, I eat well. I eat really well. And he goes, it's just genetic. He goes, my brother has heart disease. My sister has heart disease. She just had open heart surgery too. You know, just like me and my brother. It's all, it's just genetic. And I'm like, yeah. Maybe it's because you're all eating the same food. No one gets open heart disease in communities that eat plant-based diet. Zero. There's zero coronary heart disease. Yeah. Okay, but that's how the patient thinks. So I just ask them, I go, so what's like your typical, you know, dinner something? He goes, oh, no, I, I eat really good. Oh, you know, some chicken, some fish, you know, a little olive oil, olive oil a glass of wine. <laughs> the Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean diet is oh, the yeah. chump diet. It's yeah. the chump diet. Yeah. It, they, don't, they don't forbid anything. And they yeah. allow alcohol, chicken, fish. Um, and I saw the bottoms the, the, the include olive oil. Um, it's, I think what it does is it makes a person think, well, I tried to eat healthy. It didn't work because most university medical centers recommend it. Yeah. It didn't work. I tried my cholesterol still high. I got to take the pills. Yeah. I better go for cardiac cath. Maybe I'll get a stent. Stupid. Yeah. I, I mean, I know people who live in the region of the Mediterranean and they say, we don't even eat like this. You know, it's just, it's just marketing. It's just complete marketing. <clears throat> All right. One thing that I wanted to ask you about is this thing called Wilson's temperature syndrome. You know, if you're below 98.6 degrees uh, often, that it shows that you have a thyroid issue. Have you researched this at all? I have not specifically researched this Wilson's concept, but I'll tell you what I think it is. In my family, for example, I'm the only 100% vegan. All right. I'm skinny. All right. My family, they're a little fatter than me. So they, I think they got an extra insulation of fat that makes them want the temperature always colder than I do. Mm. And as a matter of fact, they were giving me fat. They were giving me a hard time. Like, oh, you know, you always want it so hot. That's because you're hypothyroid, you're hypothyroid. And I said, okay, you know what? I know I'm perfectly fine because I got good energy, got good concentration. I said, just to humor you, I will go get my thyroid check. I, my the labs are perfectly normal. Okay, that's yeah. all bullshit. All right. They're, and I say to them, I go, what's wrong with you? All winter long, you're crying because it's cold. And then as soon as it gets warm, you crank up the air conditioner. It's like, why don't you just enjoy the heat? Yeah. You know? yeah. So you don't agree with it? No, I, well, I haven't studied it in particular, <laughs> but I think there's a tendency, you know, like all, all these sick meat eater, oil eaters and stuff, you know, they point to the skinny vegan who's not in any pills. You know, you really ought to be on something. You know, maybe not. It's not normal to yeah. be on pills. <laughs> What do you think of the, I think I, I asked you, there's probably going to be some repeats, but people want to know what you think of the uh, fruit only diet. Like, you know, these fruitarians, the raw foodists. I mean, I know I did it for a long time. It's actually probably how I lost about 145 pounds. I wasn't fruitarian. I was raw vegan. Uh, but what do, you, what do you think of the whole diet as a whole? You know, I haven't completely figured that one out. And the reason I say that is I see a mixed picture there are guys like Doug Graham who claims it's the greatest thing in the world. It is 80, 10, 10 diet. Yeah. There was also a guy like, by name, I think it's Michael Arnstein. Yes. And he yeah. was an ultra marathoner and he moved to Hawaii so he could get more fruit and get it more cheaply. I think for a regular person, excuse me, kind of hard to eat 100% fruits. They're expensive. They don't store well. A lot of these fruits now, I'm worried they're spraying this new stuff on them called APEL. A-P-E-E-L. Yeah. I have not read about it in detail yet, but everything I read about it so far, it's all bad. Yeah. You don't want it. So one has to be careful about that. I would not eat that stuff. Just my preliminary reading of it is stay away from it. Um, so that's those are problems with fruits. They're quite expensive and they don't store well. And most people don't live in tropical climates, so they're not always as readily available. But, you know, I, I wonder about it. If you look at McDougal, McDougal says, we've been eating starch since we were first born, okay? Yeah, the, yeah. Since humans first came onto this planet. Yeah. You know, when exactly did we come on the planet? I don't think anybody knows for sure. 
The other argument is why do we have color vision in our eyes so we can see when fruit is ripe? It's thought to be one of the main reasons. Yeah. Um, so I don't know for sure. I do know I feel pretty good with fruit. Now, fruit, you get the nutrition. It comes with the antioxidants from different colors of the fruits. The pigments tend to relate to that. Um, so it's packaged with the fiber, which is all good. There are some things different. You know, there's this one guy, I don't remember his name. He's like the carb addiction doctor or something like that. And he's like, oh, no, none of these fruits even existed when humans came on the planet. All of these things came later. Yeah. And I do think he's partially right. I think he's right in the sense that um, a lot of these modern fruits that are so sweet, they were not around. They were sort of they've sort of been bred and developed for commercial purposes because they taste good. Yeah. over you know the centuries all right but we've always had plant foods if you go back in time there's there's evidence that people have been plant foods since the beginning of time you know and theoretically our so-called nearest related animal cousin the chimpanzee which we're much less related to than people yeah. think yeah that, you know that obviously eats plants so does the gorilla and the orangutan and stuff we're actually the only animal that cooks food which is a little bit weird too some people make that argument they go well if we're an animal how come all the other animals don't cook food and we're the only one that does cook food okay yeah. Again, McDougal says, we've been eating starch since we first stepped on this planet. So I read back some of the articles. There is evidence that humans have been eating starch for, you know, since they first came on this planet, for real. There's evidence going back to 117,000 years ago and even one probably 170,000 years ago. Somehow they figured out based on their methods that that appears to be the case. So your real question of, is it better to be 100% fruitarian or not? I actually don't know the answer for sure. But I also think that <clears throat> fructose gets a, mu a much worse name than it deserves. And I believe that's based on, you know, mixing that up with high fructose corn syrup. High fructose corn syrup in processed food is a really bad thing because it comes in excessive amounts in the processed food, often with no fiber, especially in a drink, a beverage. And then you get this bowl of high fructose corn syrup. And fructose is different than um, glucose. Fructose goes right to the liver and mm -hmm. it's almost entirely processed in the liver. And when it comes in as a bowl, it's like, let's say you guzzle some energy drinks, some soda pop or something. The liver gets all this sugar and has nothing to do with it. It just goes, what am I going to do with this? Store it as fat, store it as fat. So it does have a tendency to cause fatty liver when it's ingested this industrial fructose in the context of processed food and sweetened drinks. So I think mm. that's bad. But in terms of eating fruit, I've not heard of any significant problems from people eating fruits. And I eat about 35 to 40% of my calories from fruits. Uh, McDougal will tell you, you know, up in the ballpark, 80, 90% or something like that on his, uh, amount of fruits. And then Chef AJ is about halfway in between. And I eat a little more fruit than that. So I don't, I actually, I don't know the answer for sure because it gets a lot, it gets a lot mixed up. And then, so there's a guy named Johnson. He's a nephrologist and he's written books about all the problems with, with uh, fructose. And he's also sort of partners in some sense. I see him together talk with Lustig. Lustig is a sort of famous pediatric endocrinologist who gave a lecture, like multiple millions of views called the bitter truth about sugar or something. And so he's very anti-fructose, but fructose, I believe, is being scapegoated because the low-carb keto paleo group needs to put a scapegoat on something. And I think what they're doing is they're putting a scapegoat on to fructose. Hmm. And so I sort of think where that that's where that's coming from. You know, for let's take the bright guy, he's real articulate, but I think when you get down to it, you know, it's sort of like, here's the problem over here. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain over there. All the problems with paleo, low carb yeah. and all that. So I don't, I don't trust that guy. I, I don't, I think that, um, I actually think meat and oils are a disaster for health. Um, and I, I've yet to see a big problem with fruits. But the problems I'll run into with fruits is, you know, they'll give you cavities uh, when they're real sweet, like bananas, for example. They'll give you rebound hypoglycemia, which is not a good thing if they're too sweet. So hmm. for what am I saying is I would be watch out for bananas. Uh, cause they're so sweet. Um, I would definitely eat other foods first and get some fiber in your belly. Um, and you got to brush your teeth right away. And if you're prone to rebound hypoglycemia, be careful with that. Same thing too. If you're drinking a fruity sweetened beverage, you know, again, that's already sort of ground up. There's not much, if any fiber in there, you're going to be predisposed to rebound hypoglycemia. And that's not good because you can get this roller coaster blood glucose curve. Um, your, your body is confused by the rapid bolus of sugar. Cause that's an uncommon thing in nature and it releases too much insulin drives your sugar down. And then when your sugar's down, you feel lousy, you'll tend to repeat the process, grab something sweet or caffeinated and your, your blood glucose curve goes up and down like that, the rebound hypoglycemia effect. So what I'm saying is, I think better fruits are something like uh, blueberries, for example, sort of mm. an intermediate level of sweetness. Um, I'm okay with apples and pears like coming off a tree, but again, I don't like these coatings on it. You know, like what yeah. is that coating? 
And I wonder, is some of that coating absorbed into your body? Does some of that end up in your arteries? Who knows what it is? Nobody tells you what it is. It's not easy to find out. There is an article on Wikipedia about fruit waxing. Um, and I didn't finish reading it, but it didn't look that encouraging. Uh, the bottom line is I stopped eating apples just because even though I love to taste them, I would eat 10 of them in a row real fast. Somebody told me maybe they're spraying MSG on there. I'm like, why does this apple taste so good? I can't mm. eat 10 potatoes like that. So, you know, in a perfect world, you'd have your own orchard and I would eat the apples and pears off the tree. But in the real world, you know, you go to the grocery store and there's something sprayed on it. And so I that's why I don't eat more of those. I like watermelon, too. It's a good workout oh, yeah. food before a workout because you get uh, hydration simultaneously and it tastes good. A little nitric oxide, I think, comes out of those things, nitrates. Now, I d the reason I ask is I've had it completely different uh, with bananas. I mean, I, I I go through when I'm fully fruit or like raw, I go through like 80 pounds of bananas a, a week. And I mean, the weight, I can't even keep it on. It's almost scary how fast the weight comes off. But when I do starch, it just isn't that way. And so I'm just trying to figure out what what the hell, because the calorie count doesn't change. But the weight just, I mean, just falls off with fruit but you get tired of doing it. i mean you show up to a party with bananas you know like it, it's just you know i it, it's just kind of annoying but uh the, the, this reason i ask and a lot of people wanted me to ask you yeah that. i know and, and it's sort of like there's so many people contradicting each other and there's also durian rider you know yeah. durian rider he's a, kind of a controversial fun guy but yeah yep. i respect the fact you know he's out there competing in races training people in competitions and you know having a skinny girlfriend walk around in the bathing suit which i find yeah. kind of funny yeah, and I'm, I <laughs> The whole time while times. he rambles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but anyways, you know, so I, I, I don't want to come down harder. I know myself. I feel good when I eat fruits, and I also, like you just said, people tell you fruits make you fat, but people with a lot of experience with them are skinny. So yeah. why is you know what's her name freely the banana girl skinny? Yeah. Yeah. Why are Durian's girlfriends skinny? Why yeah. did you lose weight on fruits? Why is Arnstein skinny? You know, he runs a lot, but. People seem to be healthy and skinny. Also, there was Garth Davis. He was, uh, you know, he runs triathlons. That's a, all right. You're like the 40th person. I've got to try to look this guy up and, and see if I can get him on here. Yeah, he's good. He wrote a book called Proteinaholic. It's a good book. Um, and he himself, you know, had, had had some health problems and he then became a vegan and his energy level went up and he became a uh, triathlete. Mm. And he also says he's seen lots of really healthy fruitarian types. So, um, also, I think those mastering diabetes guys are close to being fruitarian. So I've seen a lot of people really healthy on it. And these are reliable sources of information. So I'm kind of of a mind that fruits are good. Be careful for the extra sweet ones. Um, and, you know, the stuff we talked about. Yeah, I mean, the the guy that got me started in, in vegan is a raw, raw foodie. He, uh, his name is Arnold. He runs a little uh, cafe in Lansdale, uh, Pennsylvania called uh, Arnold's Way. And I mean, he's got a wall because he's been doing this a long time. He's got a couple walls of just pictures of all the people. It's thousands of people that this guy's helped because he works off like his little cafe is right off a huge train hub. I mean, his train hub has to have like a seven, like a seven fifty thousand uh, parking, uh, you know, uh, 750 to a thousand car parking lot. I mean, it's huge. It's always busy. And he just kind of poaches people and it's just crazy how many people he's helped with this. But I wanted to ask you about, uh, seasonality. You know, what do you think about eating by the seasons? You know, we wouldn't have, if you really want to go back to whatever, however long ago, we wouldn't have potatoes for a certain amount of time. And then for the rest of the year, we'd only have potatoes and stuff like that. What do you think about seasonal eating, eating like that? Well, I think, you know, our ancestors ate seasonal because they had to. Mm -hmm. But uh, for us, you know, you go to the store and they tend to have stuff all year round. Um, and, you know, there's also the argument that Johnson and Lustig will say, well, fruits were made to go right just before winter. So the animal will eat a lot of them and fatten up. OK, like a bear fattening up for the winter to hibernate. And by the way, McDougal says fruits taste too good, especially the modern sweet ones, and people overeat them. And that's why they gain weight. And that's why he says limit it to two to three servings per day. Um, so anyways, you know, getting back to your question, seasonal eating. I really haven't given it much thought because it's not much of an issue. I mean, mm. I think that what happened is as populations move further north, they had to eat more animal foods because there weren't that many plants around in the winter, you know, and how good could you store stuff? Yeah. 
You know, some of the grains store pretty well and they're cheap. Uh, nuts store well. I don't think nuts are good for you if food's widely available, but if you're trying to store food, you know, in short quantities, the high fat food helps to get you through the winter. Yeah. So why do you think, because people, you know, my, I have a huge, huge family and most, you know, if I'm thinking back of like the eighties and the nineties, a lot of the people who are born either in the late 1800s or uh, early 1900s were still around. They were skinny as rails and they ate whatever the hell they wanted to. Now I know we didn't have a lot of preservatives, but like, for example, my one uncle, he would eat dessert until he was kind of full and then he might eat dinner, you know, and the guy lived to 94 and he was a rail and he never had any diseases. And that's, it's kind of like the case for most of my family up until my generation of aunts and uncles. And they are all, not all, but a lot of them are overweight. And I, it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I think I think I have some idea about that. I think basically the food supply is designed to make people fat and sick. And the reason I say that is if you're eating food that's non-organic, for example, typical processed food, you got soy for protein. Soy is estrogenic. Estrogen is a fat storage hormone. Estrogen mm-hmm. levels go up when a person is pregnant and they send a signal to the body. You're pregnant. The baby might need this extra weight for energy later on. So they make a person gain weight. So there's your protein is the soy. And there's also uh, glyphosate, which sprayed on soy, the Roundup, that tends to be also uh, endocrine disrupting and contributes to weight gain and causes fatty liver, for example. It's also a brain neurotoxin. And the soy is also processed with hexane, uh, which is a neurotoxin. So what I'm saying is it makes you fat and stupid. It lowers your IQ, all right? And then you say, what about the tap water? Well, tap water has got F- in there that causes cognitive impairment. You can look it up. There's tons of papers on that. In addition, um, it also has a infertility effect it's toxic to the to the gonads to the male's uh, testicles um so the water's also got a lot of estrogens in it when a woman takes a birth control the typical thing is a thinyl estradiol ee2 and she voids it out in the toilet it goes in the waterway it's too expensive to remove all these estrogenic chemicals they don't use full carbon filtration on municipal tap water so you're mm-hmm. drinking some other woman's birth control pill and guess what you're also drinking bpa bisphenol a from the plastics you're also yeah. drinking the phthalates from the plastic the pcbs so all of this stuff is going through your bodies and they tested, they show tons of the stuff. All right. So you're, that's why you, I think you have to have a, a carbon filter at the very least in your kitchen. Uh, ideally you should have a carbon filter for your whole house, especially yeah. if you're getting municipal tap water. And then what I have myself personally is I have well water with no F minus in it. Then I've got reverse osmosis in the kitchen. I got a whole house carbon filter uh, to avoid all that stuff. Okay. Um, that's, I think, about as good as you're going to do for water. Some people recommend distilled water, but I think you get into a problem with distilled water. It's so hypoosmolar, there's almost no particles in it. The way you describe water filtration, you talk about TDS, total dissolved solid. And let's say tap water is about 500, your blood osmolality is about 300. Osmolality and TDS are not exactly the same, but for all intents and purposes, they're reasonably the same. And so when you, when you carbon filter it, you're going to drop it down maybe around 200, 250 or something which is reasonable, 200, let's say. And yeah. then when you when you RO drop it down, you're gonna drop down to 10 to 110, something mm-hmm. like that. So RO is quite filtered, but when you distill it, you drop it down to zero to two. So I worry about that. That can cause hypoosmolality and be, I, you can get a little headache from it. If I drink distilled water, I get a headache. I know some yep. people don't Same have here. a problem. So let's say you have a baby. If you put a whole bunch of salt into a bottle for a baby, the baby will die from hyperosmolality. It's not made for that. So what am I trying to say is, you're basically going in the opposite direction and disrupting osmolality by drinking distilled water. There's zero to two particles in it. So I think it's potentially a little dangerous uh, for some people. Some people, they seem to, their gut seems to mix it up with other things and they handle it, but I'd be a little careful. You can squeeze a lemon into it and distillation is a pain in the butt. Um, you got to have electricity. You gotta, can only make a small amount of time. Having an under-the-counter reverse osmosis filter, even an over-the-counter reverse osmosis filter, I think is pretty good. Okay, but getting back to yeah, why people gain weight. So we talked about it. it's in the tap water. It comes from the issue of the soy is the protein in processed food. In addition, the um, the sweetener in the processed food is typically high fructose corn syrup. Well, what's high fructose corn syrup sprayed with? It's sprayed with atrazine, okay? Atrazine is a double screw job. It's super estrogenic. That's what turns the male frogs into female frogs, okay? <laughs> Great. You really want to be eating that crap? So you wonder why the United States is so feminized and overweight. There's, your, there's a big part of your answer, you know? Okay, then what also happens, uh, atrazine is not only super estrogenic, it also um, is a mitochondrial inhibitor. So it makes you tired. It slows down your metabolic rate. It inhibits complex three in the mitochondria. So it's a terrible thing. It's also neurotoxic. 
Um, and that's just your typical processed food. Not to mention, they used to filter the merc the uh, high fructose corn syrup through a chloralkali vat, which puts mercury into it. I have a friend wow. who's a molecular biologist, and he had a friend who did research on high fructose corn syrup. And he said, look, these specimens, they're all contaminated with mercury. He published that paper and got fired. Wow. Yep. Fired for telling the truth. That's what happens. Okay. Wow. The, the guy who wrote the papers, I think his name is Tyrone Hayes from Harvard. I think he's a black guy. Okay. And he's like, well, I'm grateful that I got my scholarship to go here and do research. And then he published a paper about atrazine, you know, having a feminizing effect, turning the male frog into female frog. He got all this hassled and pressure to be fired. Um, same thing with the guy who wrote the papers on GP, uh, glyphosate. Uh, I think his name was Seralini or something like that. They came after him, fired him. So that's what it is like. And, and my my friends, they tell me, if you publish papers that criticize industry, the industry will come to the university and try to get that person fired. So that's why it's hard to get the truth out there, you know, because you'll hear all these people saying, oh, soy is a health food. Yeah, right. There's tons of papers on all the problems with soy. It's just, you know, and then there's like a bodyguard of lies. All these fake modern papers are published and funded by industry saying, oh, soy is wonderful. Yeah, right. The old Asian people are eating a tiny percentage of their diet of unprocessed stuff growing in their backyard. They're yeah. not eating this modern processed stuff with hexane poured on it. And, you know, it's GMO. Who the heck knows what the GMO is, you know? All right. I, I don't even know what to say to that. Cause I, I mean, the more, the more you really look into this, the more like irritated you get. People ask me why I'm, why I'm usually somewhat irritated. And I'm like, I just was looking into something. But um, oh, I also got one more thing I forgot to say about estrogenic chemicals. People are rubbing estrogen all over themselves. OK, they are. And what I mean by that is estrogen, if you look at the molecule, it's got a cholesterol backbone, four cyclic rings. And in the corner, there's an aromatic ring, the benzene ring. And then coming off it is a hydroxyl group. That's a, so that together, hydroxyl group in the benzene ring is called a phenol. And that is what activates the estrogen receptor, which evolutionarily didn't have much competition. It turns out to be the perfect preservative. Good shelf life because of the benzene. They'll stand a shelf four or five years, not spoil. And then because the hydroxyl group, it's antimicrobial. So the point is, it's in everything. It's in shampoos. It's in soap. It's in deodorant. It's in moisturizers. All this crap. And um, like, I'm a total minimalist. I don't want any of this stuff. If you go in my bathroom, there's nothing. There's one little bar of soap, which is transparent with the fewest possible ingredients. Okay. So then you go into my wife. You know, what's the secret of a successful marriage? Separate bathrooms. All right. So you go into my wife's bathroom and she got like 55. I counted them. 55 products. I'm like, why you got all this crap in your bathroom? You don't even know what's in it. And she's like, you don't understand. I go, what do you mean I don't understand? She goes, well, a woman, if she thought it would make her pretty, she would rub shit on her face. And I go, well, that's what you're doing. That's stupid, you know? And she said, then she goes, you're just jealous because you look old. You've got wrinkles on your face. Look at your forehead right here. You got a big bitch line, a real big bitch line. She does. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, fine. You know, <laughs> you know. You got me, right? <laughs> All right, so a lot of people wanted to know what you you uh you, you, a lot of uh the plant based do plant based doctors will talk about Walter Kempner, but then they got issues with uh, the simple sugar, and he used simple table sugar, and he had successful results with it. But a lot, actually, every plant based doctor poo poos the sugar, even though it was so successful with Kempner. Why 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 is that? Yeah, that's a good point. Um. I think there's a couple of things going on. Kempner for weight loss patients, he would initially restrict their calories. So they were under significant caloric restriction and that was a part of their weight loss. Um, he started out, you know, helping the patient with hypertension and from kidney failure. And so what he wanted to do was dramatically reduce the amount of nitrogen exposure. About 75% of the work of a kidney, excuse me, is excreting the nitrogen that comes from protein. So if you reduce protein intake, you can really get down um, the amount of work the kidney does and the kidney can kind of heal and catch up with excreting waste products because the person will die from accumulation of waste products. Mm -hmm. So he fed them rice, which is relatively low in protein, about 7% protein. And then he also, for their extra calories, he would give them sugar and a little bit of fruits. Yeah. The fruits are also relatively alkaline. The kidney, you know, excretes the extra acid. So that's also giving the kidneys a vacation, so to speak. Um, and then remind me of the question again. So why, because um, I've actually had success with uh, using just straight sugar myself with doubling my testosterone in two months. So I, I don't, I don't understand. And there's actually a lot of studies. I don't know if you know who Georgie Dinkov is, but he's got a ton of them with uh, a lot of good coming out of just regular sugar, but all the plant-based doctors won't even want it. Don't even want to talk about it. 
Uh, they say it's empty calories, but then they'll promote carbohydrates uh, and that's as a nutrient and sugar is literally a nutrient, in, you know, as you know, it's a carbohydrate. So why is it so bad? Why does everybody? Yeah, yeah I'm smiling because you made me smile because you said your testosterone went way up and I'm laughing because that durian rider guy says sugar is the best stimulant for your muscles, for your brain and for your dong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was funny. Yeah, but um, I, I had the blood <laughs> test. I mean, I literally it literally doubled in two months and I was doing a pound of sugar a day, which was uh, the study that uh, Georgie had uh, sent me. Yeah, I kind of laughed, too, because I know when you feed somebody high fat, they develop insulin resistance. So they're predisposed they're tipping towards diabetes. Also, when you feed them high protein, especially animal protein, I think it has this anabolic effect that it, it also causes a bit of insulin resistance and it causes mm -hmm. high cholesterol, blood lipids. So some of the things that I would think of, well, when you're eating the, the sugar, you're getting better insulin sensitivity. But, you know, table sugar sucrose is 50-50. It's 50% glucose, 50% uh, fructose. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, you know, when you're feeding just pure sugar, then there's no fiber. That's going to come in a little fast. You could potentially get rebound hypoglycemia from that. You could potentially get dental uh, tooth decay from it. Um, and also he was calorie restricting, which also was partly how he got his, he got a lot of patients to lose weight. So I think that was part of it. I know, for example, I'll guzzle down beet juice, uh, which has got a lot of sugar in it. And I get good energy when I do that. If I have to give a talk, a long talk, or yeah. I do that if I'm going to lift weights. I know it gives me extra energy. I do high repetition squats. So I know it works in the short term. In the long term, I wouldn't do it unless I was about to work out or about to give a long talk, something where I wanted my energy levels to be high. Um, and I worry too, some of the beets are now GMO. So I worry a little bit about that. Are you going to potentially get exposed to GMO and all the stuff they spray in that? Once something's not organic, they can spray glyphosate Roundup on it. They can spray atrazine on it. And who knows what's really happening at a molecular level with GMO. I don't know what the potential toxic effects of that are. So I don't like that. But if you could get non-GMO organic sugar, would it be a good idea? Maybe before a workout, it would it would improve your energy. I wouldn't make a habit of eating it. Um, regular food got other things in it that you mm. want. Um, rice doesn't have much in it. I think a rice is a carbohydrate delivery device, but it has a little bit of protein, has a little bit of nutrients in it. So the bottom line is, I think everybody's afraid because nobody wants to say that a simple sugar or refined sugar is okay. And everyone's afraid is that maybe going to cause fatty liver, but in actual practice, we really haven't seen too much of that. Yeah. They, they haven't even McDougal talked about, they did a study with, it was women only for whatever reason, but they did a study with women only. And I think it was over three months. I think three, don't quote me. Uh, and they fed them an extra half a cup of sugar every day. They told them to eat like you normally do. Just take this half a cup and it took them three months. And the most anybody gained was a quarter pound with an extra, you know, however. So I think it was, it ended up being like 1500 calories extra a, a, a day or whatever. I don't know if it was half a cup, but it, and it, it took three months. All I remember from this, from what he was saying was they gained only a quarter at most a quarter pound over three months of doing all this extra sugar. And yeah, I'll, I'll no take a effect. guess at it. I hear what you're saying. I'll take a guess at it. When you eat the fat and you eat the protein, your insulin, you're causing insulin resistance, which is going to drive up your insulin level. Insulin tends to make you gain weight. So maybe that's what it is, is that the insulin sensitivity is so good with just the sugar that it goes right where it's supposed to, you know, and you don't get that insulin effect. That, that would be my guess. Mm. All right. Well, moving on from that, I just wanted to ask you about that. Um, I've had a couple of people, I have it written down here somewhere. I've had a couple of people, a number of people come on here and say that they're skinny, but no matter how much, uh, you know, they'll do the star solution and their blood sugar always shoots up. I have one person that said it, it, it goes up sometimes as high as 279 after just, and she said that she just eats like rice and vegetables and it'll shoot up to 279. I said, are you having fat with it? And she said, no. And, uh, I just, what, what would cause this? Do you, do you have How any idea? How long does it go up there? I mean, a, people, a person can get a transient spike in their blood glucose after eating. That's still pretty high, but I would wonder how long does it last? She you said know, for hours. For hours. It's a prolonged hyperglycemia. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm not exactly sure, but usually in the long run, people who eat the starch, because they get that fiber effect, it takes time for the intestinal tract to peel the fiber off and you get the slow absorption of glucose into the blood. And, um, it, you tend to get a relatively normal blood glucose curve a prolonged amount of time. Plus, 
you know, starch-based populations, they don't have hardly any diabetes. You know, yeah. you don't see diabetes in these rice-eating Asians. You don't see diabetes, obesity, coronary artery disease, autoimmune disease, um, none of that stuff. So it works. You know, the Tarahumara, the Yanomamo, the Papua New Guinea, they're all skinny. Along those lines, what would you say the perfect macro uh, nutrient ratio is, like percentage wise? Like uh, like with Doug Graham, it's 80, 10, 10. What would your perfect uh, breakdown be? I think you end up somewhere around that number um, if you eat a plant based diet based on starch and on fruits. You know, uh, the, the, the plant food that's kind of an outlier is the beans because beans have tons of protein. Yeah. Beans are in the ballpark of 25 to 35 percent protein you know, a little higher on the end uh, with soy. Also, soy is one of the fattest of the beans. And then I would say um, the uh, garbanzo beans are the next fattest at about 13, but that's still pretty good. Mm -hmm. So anyways, what I'm saying is if you want to lower your protein, you might want to avoid beans. I still eat beans just because they're convenient. You throw the beans on top of the rice, rice and beans, and they taste good. They got tons of fiber too, prolonged satiety. Mm -hmm. Beans are known as having the second meal effect really yeah. prolonged satiety, like perhaps more than anything. On my work days, I eat an OMAD diet, one meal a day, because it's just convenient. I'll come home, yeah. I'll eat the dinner, and then I'll go to work the next day, and then I'll eat dinner. On my day off, I'll eat a lunch and a dinner. But on my uh, work days, I like the OMAD just to save time. I get an extra hour, hour and a half of sleep, for example. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's the benefit of it. So I don't ever calculate the percentage. Actually, I did calculate the percentage once, and it did come out to about 80, 10, 10. Okay. Uh, and I think that's about where you're going to end up most of the time. You could lower that protein um, by avoiding beans. And why would you want to do that? Because there's evidence that, you know, T. Colin Campbell always talks about how avoiding animal protein is so important because it's carcinogenic. And I agree with that. Meat's like carcinogenic in over 30 ways. So there's really no good reason to eat meat. But if you look at T. Colin Campbell's studies, he gave 20% soy protein or 20% gluten protein. And I think that's a little bit unrealistic, obviously. It was in a rodent yeah. studies primarily. Meaning that a normal person, they eat a wide variety of food stuff, which are going to have slightly different amino acid compositions and perhaps, you know, relatively low plants in general in methionine and in leucine. Excuse me. But what I'm getting at is if you're eating a large amount of protein, there's going to be more methionine and leucine in there. And are you potentially getting up to a level where you're elevating insulin-like growth factor and you're elevating mTOR, mammalian target rapamycin or mechanistic target rapamycin, which are growth stimulants, Okay. So what I, you see what I'm saying? What I'm saying is guys like James R. Mitchell, he has a good talk on the internet, a video, it says something like Wilhelm Buchem Clinic or something like that. He's a Harvard nutrition researcher. But the reason I'm saying this is in his studies, the lower the protein, it didn't matter if it was in plants or animals, the longer the animals lived. And I've seen yeah. several other papers saying the same thing. Yeah. So what I'm wondering is dietary perfection, nirvana, perhaps to keep that protein below 10 or even a little lower, maybe. I don't know for sure. But what I am saying is I wouldn't want it higher. Um, there's good reasons to think that, yes, animal protein is the evil, it's the devil, but plant protein is not necessarily that great. Yeah, I, I stay away from it. I really do. But I noticed you mentioned Durian Rider a few times. When I have my protein at the 10 grams that he suggests, my digestion just stops like completely. If, it, if I go up to like 20 grams, 25 then it's normal again. So I really have to watch. I, I don't know what 10 grams ends up being, but I think it's like three to 5%. I think it just, it shut it for me anyway, my digestion just stops. So I, I yeah, I, I have to really watch with the, the macronutrients, but anyway, I got another, uh, why does uh, he have a problem? Oh, I already asked that one off uh, those. Uh, All right, so here's here's a decent question for those that have died for years, uh, twenty plus years, and now on a high carb, low fat, starch lifestyle, uh, no calories in, calories out anymore. How long can it take to start losing weight? Well, I think if you're if you're still not losing the weight as much as you want, then I would try to avoid all the high high fat foods. Okay, because those are the, like look at your look at your diet carefully, and for example, eat the low fat stuff. Rice, white rice is one percent fat. Uh, sweet potatoes, 1% fat, regular potatoes, 1% fat. So eat those foods um, and minimize the fat that's in your diet. You know, maybe the beans have a slight anabolic effect from all that protein. I'd maybe avoid those too. 
you look at those Asians. I lived in California for a couple of years. I never saw one that wasn't as skinny as a toothpick mm -hmm. um, eating the rice and whatnot. So I would minimize all those fats and I would avoid all this stuff about you don't need seeds or flax or nuts or olive oil or omega threes. None of that. I wouldn't have not one drop of oil. I would get all those estrogenics out of your diet, you know, from your water, from your cosmetic products. Uh, for example, I talk about deodorant before on here, how stupid I think deodorant is. I think in the last one with the titanium dioxide, I've I've been avoiding that for forever. But I mean, you you can mention it here. Yeah, like well, here here's the deal with deodorant. You know, the incidence of breast cancer in the upper outer quadrant used to be about twenty five percent. Now it's sixty yeah. percent. And so the point is, people put the deodorant in, and you got shared lymphatics between the breast and the armpit. And in the in that deodorant, there's estrogenic preservatives like parabenzoic acid, parabens, and then aluminum is a metalloestrogen, and aluminum's in the water too. And so anyways, that stimulates proliferation of the breast ductal cells. And what I'm trying to say is a typical consumerist brainwashing advertising. When you walk in a room, you say, hey, how you doing? You don't, you don't sniff each other's armpits. It's just stupid. People think they have to put deodorant on. They're so brainwashed. They don't use their own brain. They just copy everyone else. They don't think. And so then they do that with a lot of things. A little perfume, shampoo and conditioner. I don't even use shampoo. You know, maybe I'm bald. Okay, fine. But I find I just rinse my hair with water. It makes no difference. Yeah. I don't need shampoo. And so, and for example, with my laundry, I don't use any laundry detergent. I just throw it in there, a little hot water, and then I throw it into the um, the dryer. Don't put anything on it. Because if you put laundry detergent out of a plastic container, the plastic container itself is typically made out of BPA with phthalates to condition the plastic. Those are both estrogenic. The, de the detergent something like nonylphenol. That's estrogenic. So you got three estrogens right there. The little uh, no wrinkle squares that go in the dryer. Those are yeah. estrogenic. So you can real quickly see people could very easily put in 10, 15 estrogens on themselves. These all cause weight gain. Uh, so they're, they're making, they're, they're disrupting their hormonal system. In addition, if you eat fried foods, the fried foods like the hydroxy nonanol is thought to cause lipid peroxidation. There's a Japanese neuroscientist by the name of Tetsumori Yamashima. He wrote the papers on this and he believes that lipid peroxidation of omega-6 fats and cooking oils causes damage in the hypothalamic hunger center, the arcuate nucleus. And he thinks that's a big part of why Japanese people are getting fatter and fatter and having more dementia, because it also causes uh, damage to other brain cells. And it also can damage the pancreas, uh, beta cells of the pancreas. And he mm. thinks that's contributing to the epidemics of diabetes. So it's all bad. All that, all the oils are all bad, including olive oil. That's another big lie. All these people saying olive oil is good for you. Yeah. <laughs> olive oil is <laughs> liquid <laughs> fat. It's crap. Uh, well, what's it? Because I forget what his name. I never remembered his guy's name, but he was telling people, He's like a plant-based doctor. He tells people to have a, a liter of olive oil a day. You can't oh. drink enough of it. Yeah, that's a crock of BS. That's, I think that's Gundry. Yeah, I think it's Gundry. Crap, okay? Gundry. And also, you know what's coming out of Harvard? The Harvard School of Public Health, Walter Willett's Food Pyramid. Look it up what a joke it is. On the bottom level, he recommends olive oil and a whole bunch of other cooking oils. You know, how much money I'm going to guess is he getting from industry? Okay. I mean, I don't know that for sure. Of course I don't. But give me a break, putting olive oil and other omega-6 cooking oils as the foundation of your dietary pyramid. That's absolute horse piss. And then and then they recommend the Mediterranean diet, essentially the Mediterranean diet. Fish and chicken and nuts, a little cheese, some dairy, a little alcohol. It's all BS. Alcohol is just a neurotoxin. There's nothing good about alcohol. Not a single thing. That cardio protective thing, I think that's all BS. There was a so-called survivor effect. It's all BS. Uh, it's just it's wow you know you mentioned that with the the detergent and i used to hate washing my clothes because when i would wash my clothes and i would put them on after they were washed i would bloat and i bet you it has something to do with what they were putting i used to use tide and i used to i would bloat up i i, I it would drove me nuts i hated washing my clothes and I bet you it had something to do with what was whatever was in the uh, the tide. I never I never put two and two together, but that was that was a long time ago. Yeah, it sits on your skin, and all day long, the estrogen is being absorbed into your body because your skin is primarily lipid, and estrogen is a lipid. So, like dissolves like in chemistry. So you're all it's being absorbed into your body all day long. Plus, it goes right into your bloodstream. If you eat something, at least it goes first through the portal vein from your gut to your liver, and it gets partially detoxified, maybe about 50% detoxified versus something coming in off your clothes. It just all goes into your blood. And so it, it goes all to your tissues. The body has estrogenic effects. Wow. Wow. 
Uh, you just mentioned alcohol, but somebody asked, uh, is alcohol cause uh, visceral fat that they say is alcohol the main cause of uh, skinny fat people who look skinny, but all uh, the fat is concentrated in the liver? They have the same health complication as the obese. If yes, uh, could fake sugar have a similar but less severe impact with the liver? Okay, well, what I would say about alcohol is it causes fatty liver in a big way. It really causes a lot of fatty liver. Uh, so it's really bad for that. I'll see worse fatty liver typically in alcoholics than I will in just the regular American patients. And by the way, fatty liver is so common, it's off the charts common. And like I think over a third of Americans have fatty liver because they eat all this processed food and then processed food causes fatty liver. Yeah. Um, and alcohol makes it typically worse than a regular fatty liver. Okay, and it's a big deal. I actually had a really interesting fatty liver patient recently. This guy had a fatty liver so bad from eating processed food. He was not an alcoholic, not a drinker. And it'll progress in some patients from fatty liver. Sometimes they'll call that NAFL, non-alcoholic fatty liver. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then it'll sometimes pro progress to something called NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And the itis in the, in the last part means mm -hmm. inflammation. Inflammation then leads to scarring, collagen fibrosis. And that can cause when it's severe cirrhosis, which means fibrosis diffusely of the liver. Then the blood from the gut goes to the portal vein, tries to get into the liver. Now it's, there's a lot of resistance because of all the fibrosis. And it'll go backwards or through these uh, variceal veins into the spleen. And the spleen gets big. So why am I saying all this? Because the spleen, spleen is a blood filter. And when you get this big blood filter doubled its size or more, it starts removing platelets, removing, uh, and that causes thrombocytopenia, low platelets, removing red cells, potentially anemia, removing white cells, neutropenia. So anyways, the patient had low platelets, fell down, bumped his head, intracranial bleed, mm. too much pressure. They had to do a craniotomy to put a hole in the skull. Then they actually had to do a craniectomy. I mean, this is rare from fatty liver to have it go this bad. But the point I'm making is yeah, that's, that's how that's... this stuff goes. And they had to take off a flap of a skull, a craniectomy. And I saw him when he's getting evaluated for potential cranioplasty to put his skull back on. <laughs> what am I trying to wow. say is, you know, life's hard enough if you do everything right and you try to be good and you work hard. If you're stupid, it's it's rough, okay? Stop eating this processed food. It's a bunch of crap. It's poison. It's just a way to poison all the, the proles, you know, the proletariat minimum wage, you know, just get them all fat and sick and then just take all their money in middle age and then let them die early. You don't got to pay them any pensions or any uh, social yeah, security. That's what they're doing, yeah. Kill them off, you know, fast enough. So, I mean, you, basically that's what, that's what the average American does. The average American is... Got diabetes, hypertension, and is cognitively slow by 60 years of age. My internal medicine doctor friends, they tell me every single one of their patients over 60 is cognitively slow, kind of like a cow. Hi, yes, thank you. You know, they're very nice, but they're just, they're, they've lost all their vitality, got that tired, beaten down look. You know, it doesn't have to be that way. Oh, man. All right. Uh, here's another one. Here's another one about sugar. Does he agree with Durian Ryder about sugar uh, can't make you fat because uh, de novo lipogenesis? Uh, why does he? Uh, well, we already talked about fruit. But but, okay, but let me address that there because they're talking about de novo lipogenesis. Yeah. But you've got fructose. Fructose is not the same as glucose. Fructose comes into the liver. It enters glycolysis at the halfway point. Glycolysis starts out being six carbons, six carbons initially, but then it gets split into half. So you got two, three carbon molecules. Fructose enters after that phase. And the point being is um, normally the liver regulates how much um, sugar material is run through glycolysis. But fructose, when especially when it comes as a bolus from processed food, it hits past the regulatory step. So it all gets mm. made into fat. So fructose will make you fat. There's no doubt about it in processed food. It is not the same thing as glucose. But it wouldn't do that from... from fruit when right i mean because i've though, never when, had that happen with fruit when you're eating fruit it slows everything down because the gut has to process all the other material that's coming in there with the fructose and there's not that much fructose so um the fiber slows everything down chewing the food breaking the food into little pieces but when you drink some sweetened uh, soda pop or other energy beverage that's full of that high fructose corn syrup you get this big bolus uh comes right into your liver hmm. what if you have it with something else well, yeah, what I would recommend doing it at the least would be eat the other food first. You know, if you're going to, you know, eat the starch first or eat okay. uh, eat something first just to slow things down in your stomach before that bolus comes out. 
You keep talking about the liver, and the liver is a very important topic. What do you think about? I've been seeing a lot with uh, people taking, you know, the the good form of copper and zinc to kind of, uh, you know, get their liver back to health. What, what, what do you think that? The, the, to me, that sounds stupid. Um, the reason I say that is all these metals, like transitional metals, they've got a variable valence, and they can cycle between different oxidative states. Like the classic one is iron, Fe2 plus or Fe3 plus. And it can go back and forth between Fe2 plus, Fe3 plus if it gets free. The way these metals are, a good way to think of them is like a fire. You mm. want a fire in your house in the stove to cook food. You want a fire in the furnace to warm the house. But that's it. You don't yeah. want the fire anywhere else because it'll burn stuff down and break it. All right. So what am I trying to say is people don't know what they're doing when they take extra supplements of copper, which it can be, which is very much like iron in terms of being a transitional metal with a variable valence that can cause oxidative stress. So I would not mess around with that. Like I said, keep it simple. Be like Adam and Eve, except keep your indoor heating and plumbing. Eat the plants that go out of the ground. Genesis 129. Yep. God said, I have put every fruit bearing plant and seed bearing plant on this earth for you to eat. Okay. And we're that's, I think, the perfect human diet. Genesis 129. It wasn't until after the flood, which is something like Genesis 9.3 or something, where when there's a big flood for 40 days, all the plants were killed by the big flood. So now there's no food. So you're maybe you're stuck. You got to eat some animal foods. Okay. You got to, you know, drink a little milk or eat an egg or something. But other than that, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm just saying our physiology runs best on low fat plant-based diet. It just does. You know, I actually know a lot, uh, not a lot, I'm, not a lot, but I know enough people who speak Hebrew and I ask them to kind of translate, you know, the Torah, you know, how it actually is written, not like somehow how these, you know, doctored. Uh, and it said it, it was clear instructions, just eat animals until the plants grow again and then start eating what you're supposed to eat. It didn't say to keep eating animals and they just did because it's so addicting. It's so, you know, habit forming and it's just it's gotten out of hand, you know. But uh, all right, so here is another one. Does he? Uh, do you think that fresh squeezed or cold pressed orange juice or grapefruit juice is good or bad? If he thinks it's bad because of most of the fiber go gone, uh, why would that matter if we are already eating enough fiber? Well, I mean, like I said too, I would eat the other foods first and then add that on top. I usually would just eat the food, eat the orange, for example, but. You know, at least you're eating a real food. You get some organic orange and you, you're running on the little thing. You're getting a little exercise making it, too, if you make it by hand. Uh, I think it's probably not that big of a deal. I can tell you, you know, Dr. Esselstyn, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, he recommends avoiding the juicing just because, again, mm. you, you reduce the amount of fiber. You speed up that absorption. Yeah. Uh, but it depends how much of it you eat, you know. And so if you're going to eat tons of sweet fruit, that's not such a great idea and pour sugar in there. You're going to bolus yourself with that sugar with le relatively little fiber to slow it down. Um, you put more veggies in there. There's not so much sugar. That might be a little better. I really don't like smoothies because I think they're so loud. Um, I recommend anybody who's making them get some ear protectors because otherwise you're going to go deaf. You know, yeah. like my wife, she wanted to, she said she's going to lose weight by having smoothies. I'm like, why don't you just become a vegan? She goes, oh, no, I don't want to do that. Okay. And so I said, then she's running the thing. I go, let me, let me know in advance so I can get out of the kitchen. You're going to be deaf. You're going to be a fat deaf woman. And she's, <laughs> so anyways, uh, they're pretty loud. They're pretty noisy. I don't like those blenders. Yeah. So. But maybe it's good for your health then because then it's a deterrent from actually making them again. Maybe it's, maybe it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's good for, all right. Here's there the are some people who say it's really helped them. So maybe it is healthy, but at least put the ear protectors on so you don't go down. It helped me quite a bit, like 145 pounds down from, you know, but this was years ago. All right. So here's the last question that I have and, and anybody else has is, uh, is, uh, do you think that white rice is good or bad? Um, that is, uh, white rice or brown white rice better. Man, it's a long question. If he thinks brown rice is better than white, can you ask him why uh, brown is better if it has, because it has more fat in it? Yeah, and that, there's a couple trade-offs. Um, there's there's like this oily fat in the outer part of the brown rice, which, you know, there's a problem with that is it, it makes it more prone to going rancid. It'll spoil faster than white rice does. So that's a negative. In yeah. addition, brown rice has higher arsenic levels. And don't get me wrong, the arsenic level in rice is much less than it is in chicken, for example. 
And that's partly where it comes from. But there, there's two sets of issues with arsenic, with the rice. Is in the southeastern United States where they used to have cotton crops, they used to spray arsenic type pesticides on there. It takes many decades to get it out of the soil. So I wouldn't buy rice from those areas. Okay. But there's even rice in the organic rice. There's even arsenic in the organic rice because the chicken farmers would give arsenic antibiotics to the to the chicken, something like roxarosone, something like that. Um, and then they found that it made the chicken stay fresh looking longer in the store. So they they like giving them that arsenic um antibiotic like anti-parasite medication. And then they sold the chicken poop to the rice farmers, including the organic rice farmers. So even the organic rice has arsenic in it. Some of the places will post their numbers. If you get organic rice and you know some of them like Lombard Farms is kind of famous and there's other places too, look at their numbers that are relatively low. I give it an extra one or two rinses first. I still eat white rice. I still eat it a couple times a week. Yeah. Um, and I know lots of other people do that uh, have been done it for decades. They don't seem to have any problems. I haven't noticed any problem with it, but um, there's probably a little bit in there. I don't know if you can completely escape the arsenic, um, but that's why I prefer white rice. I prefer white rice because it's got lower arsenic. It stores longer. Uh, Kempner fed all his patients white rice. It tastes a little better. Um, and probably the main reason that guides me is the fact that it's uh, got less arsenic in it. I mean, for me, it's the only seed that we don't shell. Like you don't it, like if you're somebody who eats walnuts, you don't just eat them off the tree. You you take them out of the shell. Uh, so I don't understand why you wouldn't want to take a seed out of, out of a shell because most of the shells have inhibitors, uh, you know, and toxins in them to keep uh, you know pests and us from eating them. So I, I I just don't know why people would leave it on there in the first place. But speaking of peels, the one last question I, I I had is: Did you? I know you said you researched this appeal a little bit. Did you see they're they're refusing to publish the ingredients on this? The only one that they'll publish, and they're calling it organic because it's organic, is citric citric acid. But there's like ninety nine point three four percent of something else in there, and they won't publish it. Yeah, that's a bad sign when they don't want to tell you. Plus, citrate. I know citrate sometimes can be a little bit of a trick. Now, I don't know if this is the case with APO, but sometimes something like sounds really benign, like citrate might even be more than just citrate, you know? Yeah. Um, like if you post ingredients for something on the first ingredient, I think it has to be just itself. But my understanding on labels is subsequent ingredients can have other things added to them without them having to include that in there. And the bottom line, I would say is if it was something good, they would want to tell you it would help yeah. them to sell more. So whenever they don't want to tell you like natural flavors, that means they don't want to tell you it's something bad. It probably is. I, I mean, would. Why, I would stay yeah, away why else it. would they block you from? I mean, I hope the FDA loses this case that they're in right now with the government going after them. Because, uh, I mean, since 2020, they've basically done, done whatever they, they feel like. And it, it's just getting out of hand. I mean, they got to start publishing this stuff. Yeah, I don't think they're ever going to protect the consumer. The consumers are a bunch of lowlifes. What I mean by that is, Consumers have no money. No one cares about regular people. It's the same thing in the medical world. Regular people are poor. There's nothing they could do. What I mean by that is, let's say a big company, a big company that makes something. They can go to the regulatory. They can hire all these expensive lawyers, send them to be lobbyists. They can pay off all these so-called investigating institutions and stuff. So what I'm saying is, it's never going to be good. It's never going to get better. Uh, I'll just share you like a story I told my kid one time. This is many years ago. My kid comes to me. He's like, you know, dad, I think my teacher gave me a bad grade. It was unfair. And he talked to me a little bit about that. And I know sometimes you get screwed over in school, but one of the things I told the kid was, and he's kind of like, what can you do? I hate to say it, but I think this is reality. I said, to some extent, imagine there's a rabbit walking down a path in the forest. Mm -hmm. And over there, there's a hawk in the tree. Over there, there's a snake and there's a bunch of coyotes. You know, is the coyote, the snake, the hawk ever going to be nice to the rabbit? No, they're never going to be nice to the rabbit. Forget about it. OK, I said the rabbit has to be smart, it has to make a system of burrows that it can hide in. It has to make friends with some of the other animals in the forest. They can help each other. It has to pay attention to the birds to give a warning when the predators come in. And I, then I said to my kid, I go, you're the rabbit. OK, that's the way life is. Learn how the world is so you can su successfully navigate it. It's not going to change. It's not going to go out of its way to be nice to you. It is what it is. Yeah. And I think that's how it is. These companies are always going to rip people off. And I actually think it's almost as if they're intending to make everybody uh, overweight and infertile. I mean, look at all the things that make you infertile. It's in all the processed food. It's in your water. It's in it's in the, the, the processed soy. It's in the processed 
uh, fructose. It's it's all over the place. Um, it's not that easy. And it turns out even stevia now is associated with infertility. So um, that's what I'm saying. Be like Adam and Eve eating simple whole foods with nothing, as far as you can tell, as little as possible on them. Um, I think that's the way to be healthy. I think that's perfect. Do you have anything else to add? Because that, that's all the questions I had. Uh, gosh, anything new? Not big off the top of my head that I can think of. Um, just, yeah, minimize your exposure to chemicals. I've also known that people tend to, you know, you're afraid if you see a snake, you're afraid if you see a spider, but they tend to be oblivious to chemicals. And I think there's a lot of toxic chemicals. Like I yeah. recently hearing about trichloroethylene associated with dry cleaning traditionally, but also a lot of things like paints and glues. If you're working with any, or cleaning chemicals too, open the door at least, okay? Because I see a lot of people that work with toxic chemicals at their job or in their home with the cleaning chemicals. You know, ventilate the place because that's associated with Parkinson's disease. And I think that also over time leads to people getting sick. Um, yeah, uh, speaking of which, I mean, uh, do you see how toxic this stuff is that they put on telephone poles? I mean, that stuff is such a carcinogen and, and it it really radiates like it's not. So think about it, all the rain <laughs> that comes down those telephone poles and then it spreads out all over the place. It, it's just, what do you do? It's like, you got to walk around in a hazmat suit. Yeah. I, I also think, you know, um, people are sort of programmed in America to think there's always this abundance, you know, and it's sort of like they all want to spray all this stuff on their grass. And this actually caused an argument between my wife and me. Uh, I like to just do the grass with a push mower and yeah, I'll miss a couple dandelions. And then it's like, you know, I'm a jerk. I'm lowering the property value. I'm an embarrassment to the neighborhood, all this crap. And I'm like, you know what? You spray this stuff on there, not uncommonly atrazine on your grass. The dog rolls around in the atrazine. Then it comes in the bed and rolls on your face, rubbing atrazine on your face. Um, and so then also you've taken all this good topsoil that is your lawn and you've destroyed it with all these chemicals just because you're embarrassed to have a dandelion. Okay, you know, don't be surprised if there's a big famine coming and you can't grow any food because you destroyed all your soil. Stupid. Perfect. Everybody's stupid. That's a good good way to end the uh, the interview. Well, what I'm trying to say is, I'm like, well, why don't we grow food in our yard? Why don't we yeah. we have food? Why do you want to spray all this crap on there? No, I, I no thought idea. we ruined all our soil. You know, if I was if I ran for president and somehow got in, the first thing that I would do is make grass illegal. I would I would want to see everybody. Uh, growing, uh, you know, in their yard in some capacity. I'm so just like, I don't, I mean, I cut my grass, but I'm not going to spray anything on it. I don't really care what it looks like. I, you know, I'd rather not have it, but you know, I, I, I what can you do? It's hey, just, let, me, let me just add one thing to that along those lines. Kids go to school. What do you learn in school? It's a bunch of crap. What do you remember from grade school or high school other than how to type? Okay. I remember almost nothing. You memorize a bunch of vocabulary words you forget them the next day. Those kids should be learning how to grow food. They should be learning how to purify water, okay? They should be learning how to fix stuff in their own house. Um, you know, things that are useful. But you can't have a 12-step program if you teach something something useful to kids. You can't you can't brainwash people. You can't turn them into little little uh, you know, robots that stick over here and stick over here if you teach them actually how to how to how to be humans. Yeah, school makes them conformist. And yeah. I actually think they should not have children all the same age all the time together because when you're around a bunch of kids your own age, all you care about is social stuff, being popular. I like the old-fashioned one-room schoolhouse where the older ones teach the younger ones. There's a little bit of variety and in interaction, and you help people you help people help each other. When a young kid interacts with an older kid, there's teaching going on, especially when there's adults around to supervise them. Versus, I think the modern school is really designed to make the kids kind of helpless. You know. All they know how to do is take a Scantron test, which is essentially worthless in the real world. Uh, and they haven't learned any significant skills. And then they get out in the real world. They're not really ready to do much. No, nobody is. And it's it's actually gotten way worse. You know, I worked at the post office for years. And it's like people can't even fill out a, a letter to, to mail. I'm like, how is this possible? Like, even people, you know, coming in and they're 65 and they're like, you know, like older, you know, not like super old, but. And they're like, well, where do I put the mail? I'm like, how How do you not know in 65 years that it just goes in that blue box right there? It's It, it, it baffles the mind. It really does. So I, I'm going to have uh, Peter on here again. 
uh, probably maybe in August. So if you have any questions, leave them down in the comment section. Leave any comments, questions down there. Like, subscribe. Um, like I said, I'll put all, all of your links uh, in the description section. If I remember, I'll put them in the comment section as well. And uh, thanks for being on here. Oh, my pleasure. All right, perfect.